Finally, well, this gentleman, you talk about historians and the breadth of knowledge that he possesses. Uh, he was chairman of the Waltham Historical Commission. Lifelong New England sports fan. But aside from that, he's the president of the Civil War Roundtable of Greater Boston. Had it not been for this gentleman, I wouldn't have been able to connect with the 54th. Uh, he's helped with educational efforts, graveyard desecration repairs, and preservation of all historical sites and effects. A leading authority on military actions in the war between the states, he's now going to present Civil War in New England. I present as Clarence W. Barron, reporter, David Smith. Thank you very much. Uh, before I begin uh, my portion of this program, uh, as Clarence W. Barron, let me just uh, step out of character for a moment and make a couple of statements. First of all, uh, we, we are the 13th oldest uh, Civil War Roundtable on the whole planet, and we were the first ones in all of New England. We get involved with everybody and everything. Uh, one of the things we got involved with was uh, my Civil War Roundtable, and I was there on the committee for the Hope and Glory celebration, which in 1997 did celebrate the Garden, Shaw Memorial, and the 54th Mass. Um, and I also have to maintain that while I was in the committee, 18 months before that wonderful day in May, uh, when the sun was shining brightly on all of us, I was the idiot that sat at that table when we talked about it getting a keynote speaker. And the name of Colin Powell came up. And I said, are you people crazy? We'll never get him. And guess who was the keynote speaker? Um, and I had to shake his hand and say, please don't, don't leave me because I didn't want you. Um, anyway, and by the way, uh, George Koblen, I know him from many, many years. I knew him uh, going to the schools and stuff. And he was very instrumental in a, a lot of things that went on in making history better in, in the schools of, of uh, Massachusetts. So um, we have a lot to be thankful for. And also, by the way, before I forget, if anybody here was told by Emmett that uh, his part in the movie Glory was paid by uh, Denzel Washington, that's not true. Not true. No one wanted to play Emmett's uh, part, so. Anyhow. Now, we're here in, uh, in uh, 1883. And uh, I see Mr. Alexander Graham Bell has developed something else from his telephone that I could use as a marvelous mention of communication. My name is Clarence W. Barron. I am a reporter for the Boston Evening Transcript. I used to be a reporter for the Boston Post. Uh, yes, in those days we had a lot of newspapers around. Uh, and there were good newspapers in those days. Not so much today, but that's okay. Um, and, and one of the things I do while uh, mostly finance uh, reporting is I also love history. And I tend to try to do some work. Uh, and now that the War of the uh, Rebellion is over, the American Civil War, that great, incredible, tragic, fratricidal event, uh, and we've gone through Reconstruction and we are now back in 1883 now, and not only have we had our first president assassinated, we've now had our second president assassinated. James Garfield last year was assassinated. Now Chester Arthur is our president, and this country is moving ahead. But while it moves ahead, we must not forget what we came from. And what we came from, a short, a few years ago was an incredible, bloody, savage war that was fought mostly by young men, and yes, some young ladies, we'll get to that later on, from both sides. And I always refer to this as Americans fighting Americans. This is the second American Revolution. The first one, we were British citizens fighting British citizens. And this one, we are Americans fighting other Americans. The war was fought over slavery, the war was fought over states' rights, the war was fought over economy, the war was fought over a lot of things. But it was fought over the words in our Declaration of Independence and our U.S. Constitution. Let's never forget that. Those are the words, and that's the only reason, that's the only cause that the war was fought. Everything else, yes, was a good excuse or a good part of it. And being fought by all these young men and women, I'm gonna to try to do in a few minutes. Uh, this program is gonna be done on Wednesday evening, coming at the Charles River Museum after the full program. So you're not gonna to have to listen to me do all of this. But then what Jay Horrigan, some people do wanna hear me talk a little longer than 10 minutes, so. Sure, uh, go, go for it. Jay. James or John, either one. So. Uh, 
I'm going to read you a couple of lines, uh, because these are long letters, and, and in one case it's a long journal. But these are the words, the feelings, the emotions, uh, and what was happening to the real men, and as I said, the real women, that's where I'll end, um, those that were out on the battlefield, those that were wounded, those that died. They were writing home to their mothers and fathers, their wives, brothers and sisters, whatever. November 23rd, 1862, in a place called Falmouth, Virginia, from a soldier in Connecticut named John Nelson Black. Dear sister, I thought I would write you a few lines to let you know that I'm still living and in good health, and at present we are laying on this side of Fredericksburg. This winter we have seen one battle, and the killed was awful. We buried 44 from our regiment. I helped to bury them, and it was a sight I shall never forget, your loving brother, John. But when Black's 1862 letter is read, a tiny trickle of anticipation crescendo uh, comes to a roar as history flows from the page. On August 24th of 1862, at the age of 30, he leaves behind his wife, Rebecca, and two toddlers in Stratford, Connecticut, to enlist in the 16th Connecticut. And eventually he will go through this whole thing. One of my great heroes in writing is a man named Walt Whitman. Walt is Clarence W. Barron and as David L. Smith. I love Walt Whitman. When I read Walt Whitman, I cry. Walt Whitman has said, the real war will never make it into the books. And ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you that is so true. The real war will never, has never made it into the books until, say, the last 20 years. Now we're publishing a lot of the letters and the diaries and journals uh, that are being found. And I found this as, as a newspaper reporter. Families have given me these letters. Some have been published in other newspapers. And this is what I'm reporting to you now. From a place called Harrison Point on July 5th, 1862, from a soldier here in Massachusetts, William F. Baldwin, which is 20 miles from Richmond. Dear Father, I suppose you will be surprised to learn that I'm here, and I've been here but two days. We arrived here on Thursday about noon, and we were hurried off the boat without our knapsack. We had 50 rounds of cartridge given us as soon as we landed. There were nearly 100,000 men here. I should think we could be here, the shells going through the air, where the rebels were shelling the woods. They were some ways off, but they seemed near to us. We expected to be brought into the section that day. Now, in all the letters that I'm going to read tonight, and all the letters you'll read in books that have been published, in newspapers that have been published and, and written, um, there's an amazing, at least to me, there's an amazing kind of emotion that goes through this in, in every way. These are young men and women that are writing home, as I said, to their mothers and fathers and their spouses. Now, they're not afraid of talking about what the conditions were. They're not afraid of talking about, as you'll hear in one of the other letters, about whether or not I will die and get killed. Yeah. And they're telling this to their mother and father. Now, if I never said that during the 60s to my mother and father when I was in the service, I don't, I'd been in a lot of trouble, but you know, that didn't happen. So, But it was a different kind of a war. And, and I know that this is true. Um, again, to step out of character, if you look at the Confederate poetry, if you look at the Confederate letters and journals, uh, they're, they're exactly the same as the ones that our soldiers here in, in Massachusetts and Connecticut and New York and, and New Hampshire were writing. They're all the same. They're 17 years old, they're 20 years old, they're 25 years old, in some cases a little older. Uh, some cases very young, 14 years old. Uh, and they're not afraid to tell, uh, you know, the real truth. You know, not hard. Dear mother, it's a separate letter from his, to his father. I received your letter with much pleasure. I was glad to hear that you were all well. I am quite well, although we fare rather hard. We live on hard bread mostly, that's the hard tack. We have fresh meat once in a while, but it is not fit to eat half the time. That's because of the maggots and all the other stuff that's around. So well, that's another, another subject. Um, yesterday we left our encampment and moved about a mile down the river. I have seen Frederick Wellington several times. He is well. My hair is not long enough to cut. I've had it all cut enough since I was at home. There are 50 men going out of our regiment to join some battery. I do not know which one. 